Good day to you one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins, and this is Justin Hawkins Rides Again. I'll just put this log to one side. Um, I broadcast to you live from my grandmother's uh, cottage here in the uh, Scottish Highlands. And uh, today is Comments Day. It's episode, let me just, 38 of Comments. So, oh, as you can imagine, I'm absolutely thrilled to uh, react open-heartedly and honestly to a selection of your missives and I'll do so now Justin Hawkins rides again again those of you who are wondering, that's an E minor 9, I think, because it's an E minor. But then you do this, which adds the second or rather the ninth note in the uh, scale at the first position, making it a 9. So here we go, comments. Skirt Browning says, I am curious if there are any songs that make you cry. Oh no. Not from nostalgia, but because of the music stroke lyric. I can't help it with Could I Have This Dance by Anne Murray. Likely because I'm a 40-year-old Canadian genetically programmed to react that way. Um, it's a lovely super thanks comment. Thanks, Skirt. Um, what makes me cry? Oh, God. Um, oh, there are so many, actually. There's some Richard Thompson stuff that makes me cry, actually. If you, if you listen to... Um, the Richard and Linda Thompson album. I want to see the bright lights tonight. So let me have a look here. They don't do it in that Irish accent. It probably wouldn't make me cry if it was like that. Um, I want to see... Okay, so the album, I want to see the bright lights. Oh, there's a, there's a few on there. Um, Withered and Died. I mean, you can tell from the title just how sad that one's going to be. Um... Has He Got a Friend for Me? Beautiful song. Um, maybe Drunken Angel by Lucinda Williams. There's a lot of Ron Sexsmith stuff that makes me cry. Um, but it's always about the, the lyric and how emotive the lyric is as opposed to the music, I think. Um, thanks for your comment. I'll, 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 have a, I'll think more about that one, actually. Next time something makes me cry, I'll make a note of it and I'll mention it in one of our episodes. David Orr, on the subject of appearance, what was your reason for getting work done on your teeth? <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Um, when you first appeared on the music scene, I, I read something about how you refused to fix your teeth after US record execs asked you to in order to be more popular in the US. I applauded you for giving them the two-finger salute. I was surprised to see in your interview for the Professor of Rock YouTube channel wearing braces. Yeah, um, I always wanted to have braces when I was a kid. And um, we couldn't afford to do that, and they weren't bad enough to justify it. But they were pretty bad for me. I, d I didn't like it when we started coming through as a band, and a lot of the press was centred around the fact that I have bad teeth, or I had bad teeth. So the other thing that I didn't appreciate was being told by uh, uh, any record executive to do something about my appearance. <laughs> that always makes me go like this. Because I think in my heart, I probably am a little bit of a punk punk rocker you know so there's no way I would do it for anybody else but I actually always wanted to do it for myself so when I had a chance to do it and we sort of didn't have that much to do in a year I went and got my teeth changed and I've never looked back I smile all the time even when there's nothing to smile about and it does actually make me feel a bit better about myself <laughs> I, I enjoy smiling um, so yeah and that's all thanks to the sterling efforts of uh, the dentists in Switzerland the other thing to mention is that just before having these braces, um, the way my teeth were arranged was causing me quite a lot of pain in my jaw. So it was kind of something that had a cosmetic side effect to something that was that was actually causing me a lot of distress. And I'm really glad I did it. But thanks a lot for your comment. I appreciate that. Bobo Momchilovic says, can you perhaps tell us more about your writing trips? How does that look like? How long are they? How do they work? Or do they work? Maybe for the next comments day. Thanks, Justin. Keep on writing again. Thanks, Bobo. I certainly will. Um, well, let me tell you. I get up in the morning, 7 o'clock. I go for a run. I eat my breakfast. 
I walk over to the cottage where we're operating together and um, we write songs. We do it live, whole band, guitars, everything loud, just go for it, find riffs. Then we take those riffs and we sit down and interpret them as kind of acoustic songs, pick out the melodies, work on the lyrics, and we just get sort of outlines and song starts. In the last few days, we've amassed something like 30 song starts, um, and we'll choose our favourite ones and develop them, and then we'll record them properly. That's a whole other process, which I'll talk to you about another time, probably. John Turnbull, another super thanks. Cheers, John. Um, hi, Justin. On the other side of the coin, um, in regards to songs you can't stand that you'll never play live, <laughs> how do you reconcile with songs that you love that you also won't play live? As a Darkness fan, I personally love all your album closes. Blind Man. Okay, that's from the second record. So Long, which wasn't an album closer. That was actually just a bonus track, but it appears last of the bonus tracks when you stream the album. Um, Guitar Men, oh, I'm really fond of Guitar Men. Seagulls, again, that was, a, that was a bonus track. Stampede of Love, bonus track. All legitimate bangers, as the youths say. Um, do you ever feel a pang that you won't play those songs live? Cheers from Brisbane, Australia. Well, sometimes we play... I would say that So Long might have uh, some kind of renaissance at some point because i just think that's a great song guitar men we are the guitar men rather i love that one too um we used to do it live with just me on an acoustic um while the others got changed and then i would go and get changed while they started the next part of the set and then i'd come out with my spangly costume and kill it <laughs> every single night i'm just kidding <laughs> i did though and uh i don't know i think guitar men i just love that whole arrangement on the record it's, it's a difficult thing to play live but totally worth it I reckon so of those ones so long and guitar men definitely um thanks for your comment John Sir Plants a lot um asks 80sness of the production you've said this before what does it mean for a production to have an 80s quality wow there's a lot of things that I identify as 80s production techniques um it's to do with like the bombast of the drum sound it's to do with how loudly things are mastered it's to do with um like, I think if you listen to music from the noughties, actually more recently, like m music from the, t from the 2020s, let's say that, I think you'll hear a lot of compression on a lead vocal, whereas I think in the 80s, it was ridden a lot. So, you know, that if there was a, a dynamic um, variation in the, in the sort of volume of the, of the vocal, then you would ride that and with an automated desk and, and try to avoid using compression wherever possible. Um, so everything sounds super cr clean and crisp and not like you've got golf balls in your mouth. And, and I think after about sort of 19, mid 90s, let's say, everything was really, um, I think, coming towards the end of the, of the sort of CD era, things were being mastered as loudly as possible because it was basically a competition to see who could sound the loudest on the, on the radio, really. Everything was sweetened and compressed and pushed to the maximum, like really hitting the limiter hard. Um, you never used to get that in the 80s. You can, you can actually see that. If you look at something that was mastered in, in the 80s, it's the, the waveform itself is just much smaller, and nowadays it's just, it just looks like a sausage. Um, so you get a good sort of visual, visual representation of the differences if you actually import a CD that was, you know, that was burnt back then um and between the in the in the 70s there was a really sort of crisp and tight drum sound you know the snare drum would would have barely any kind of residual reverberation on it and and then like compare it to stuff in the 80s where it had either a huge gated reverb if you're phil collins or just a massive reverb that seems to last forever if you're everybody else and you know in the 80s was was an interesting period i think but um for me, it suits a certain type of music and less so others. Um, and when you hear like bands whose catalogue takes them across decades, you can you can actually hear a period when those bands from the seventies started to try and sound eighties, so they could compete with the other things that were on the radio. Um, a great example of that is um, Status Quo when they were doing stuff like down down deeper and down but down 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 get down and then in the eighties you'd have Whoa, whoa, we're in the army now. Hand grenades flying over your head. You know, they completely 
changed, you know, and, and I think a lot of that was because of the way you were obliged to make records in that decade if you wanted to be competitive. Um, so that's what I mean, really. I hope that helps. No Cover Charge says, thanks. And do you have a have real-life experience with uh, Johnny Marr or Billy Duffy, two of your favourite British guitarists? Yeah, they are two of my favourite British guitarists. Um, I've had... I've had a good amount of interaction with Billy Duffy over the years. Um, in fact, I'm not sure if... I don't think he'll mind me saying that he nearly lent, he nearly rented me an apartment in, in, um, in Los Angeles a few years ago. Um, and uh, when he used to text me, he used to call himself the rock and roll landlord, which I loved, obviously. I'm a, I'm a Billy Duffy apologist at best, worshipper at worst. I think he's a genius. ML Cool J says, Great vid. Thanks, Justin. For a future video or comments day, you've mentioned your early work in advertising and making close but not suable versions of existing songs. Could you share some of your recreations? Amazing channel. I'm hooked, and I've hooked my husband too. Nice one, ML Cool J. Um, yeah, I did some work for a fizzy drinks company called Tango. I did some work for HSBC, Children's Tax Credit, Mars Bars. Um, I think I did a Coca-Cola advert at one point. Um, I did all kinds of stuff. I don't even know if I'd be able to count them all. Audi? I think I did an Audi. I think I did an Airbus commercial. I did a... My favourite one was a, a cinema commercial for a, um, a charity called Rubber Stuffers that, that, uh, whose main objective was to educate um, gay men about safe sex in cinemas. Um, and that was like an, a minute-long piece. Oh, yeah, the Church of England as well. I did two things for the Church of England that uh, ended up winning prizes in the cans, I think. And, um, well, not because of my contribution, but actually the, the, the campaigns themselves were well thought of in the advertising trade, and I've done all kinds of cool stuff. Thanks to some brilliant relationships with uh, ad agencies. But just have a listen around and use the comment section here if you think you... Uh, spot something that could be mine. Ethan Murphy with a lovely super thanks says, Hi Justin, I'm curious. Um, you've said you like Queen's 70s albums best, but are you a fan of any of their 80s albums? If so, which is your favourite? I personally love A Kind of Magic and The Works. Thanks. Well, when I was 14, The Miracle came out. That was a big album for me, but I don't actually listen to it that much now. I think of the 80s efforts, I would say that a kind of magic is the one that I've listened to the most. But there's also live magic, isn't there? That was that was a great... Uh, I think it was recorded at... Um, I think it must have been recorded at Nebworth or something like that. It's the one that's got the helicopter with the Queen live magic livery on it, um, looking atop an uh, enormous throng of people and a brilliant performance. So that's that's probably my favourite one. Yeah, that one. So all that remains today is to say uh, thanks to all the super thanks people who have supported me. I really, really appreciate it. You have no idea how much it means to me. This blanket is too warm, I'm sorry. Um, so, Jason Lizowski, Schultzas. This is going to be a car crash again. Sorry, guys. Um, Louis Silver, Kendrick Vatterson, Perry Urban, John Turnbull, Gen Gen 81, Dreadnought Trucking LLC, Graham Dallas, Simula 77, John S3, Skirt Browning, Reed Jorgensen, Jim Bug Orca, Criviet, Steve Polari, Matthew Hollards, Rocco Pellerin, Just Jean, and Nick B. Thank you all so much. Don't forget, always use the comment section, and we will always endeavour to answer the stuff that's interesting. And, um, yeah, just keep coming back and adieu and I'll see you on the ice. <laughs> Justin Hawkins rides again. I hate this guitar so much. Again. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell for notification and watch one of these two videos. I love you guys. See you soon.